Hello, property investors. My name's Goose. My name's Gabby. And you are listening to the Investor Lab. Today, we've got something a little special for you. We, we just, do. Yeah, we just decided we wanted to cover a topic that we're really passionate about called the rise of the real estate entrepreneur. Nice. Now, we thought we'd just give this a little bit of a framework so that you know what you're getting into, so you can decide if this is going to be an episode for you and, and you know, whether it's going to be beneficial to you. Because we value your time just as much as we value our own. So <laughs> this episode is really ideal for anyone who wants to become a full-time investor or a business owner who is thinking about real estate investing. The concept around real estate entrepreneurship is really about defining the difference between you know, people who are passive uh, investors, who are, who are happy um, living the life that they've got and they're just trying to set up a little nest egg and people who, want to re- people who really want to become uh, the master and commander of their own destiny. And I think that's a really big distinction. So the purpose of this episode is not to have an exhaustive exploration into all of this stuff. It's to give, give people a thinking paradigm and a framework on how to approach your property journey to achieve better results and to approach it with a business framework. Yeah. So basically, we, we go through 10 steps, 10 key elements that we've identified are really going to help you to do the work on and to map out how to get to where you want to go. And how to, you know, become that full-time real estate entrepreneur. Yeah, 100%. So we explore all concepts. What is a real estate entrepreneur? What are the steps you need to take to operate as a business and not as a hack? And, uh, and really gives you a really good grounding and a few good, good points of reference to be able to achieve that. We believe that real estate entrepreneurship is something that can be achieved by anyone. Mm-hmm which is why we're passionate about this. And what you can expect from us over the coming months uh, and years is more content, which is tying the concept of real estate investing to business because these things are intrinsically entwined. And I think that that's a conversation that needs to be broadened within our community. And speaking of community, if you have found this content to be useful and you want to find out how you can get more of it, participate more closely, communicate with Gabby and I directly, surround yourself with other like-minded entrepreneurs, investors, and the like, just head to theinvestorlab.com.au, check out the community page, join us there. There's loads of good stuff in there. We've got um, workshops, masterclasses, we do location deep dives, suburb reports, um, deal reviews, all kinds of heaps good stuff designed to accelerate your property journey and to help you on your real estate entrepreneurship journey too. Gabby, have you got anything you want to add? No. Okay, awesome. <laughs> well, guys, to that degree, um, I know that this is going to be super impactful for you if you are someone who wants to become a full-time investor or if you're a business owner who's thinking about investing in real estate. Um, you know what? And even if you're neither of those, but you want to just expand the way you think about property, I think this is going to be really beneficial yeah. for you too. Yep. So um, check it out. And we'd also love some feedback. So if you've enjoyed this, please um, leave, rate and review this on whatever platform you're on. Um, if you found it beneficial, you know somebody else who would like this, please share it with your friends. It really, really helps uh, for you to do that kind of stuff. So rate, review, share, like, comment. Thumbs ups everywhere. Thumbs ups everywhere and generally participate because we love creating this kind of stuff for you and we hope that it is impactful and helps you on your journey and we also love the feedback. So anything you've got to say, let us know. Good, bad or indifferent because you help shape this journey too. Cool. See you on the inside. Let's do it. Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Investor Lab. My name's Goose. My name's Gabby. And today we're going to be talking about something just a little different, something that (laughs) um, is really important to both Gabby and I and something that I think will be important to you and also is going to help open up some new ideas and new thinking paradigms for property investors, business owners, and all of that kind of stuff. So let's just get stuck into it. Yeah. So something we've been talking about a lot in the past couple of weeks is this idea of a real estate entrepreneur. Mm. So that's kind of what we want to touch on today is really the rise of the real estate entrepreneur. So 
Did you want to? Yeah, I mean, like, the, <laughs> I mean, it sounds like that sounds all good, but are we just smashing two things together? Like, is is that you know, is that unnecessary? Now, for a little bit of context, real estate entrepreneur is not an analogy or a framework that that we have invented, right? What we have noticed is through reading uh, a lot of different stuff from all over the world, like we get our um, we get our real estate knowledge not just by looking at Australia, but we look at you know the America and uh, the Americas, the US, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and it was a terminology that we sort of stumbled across in our you know over these past months. Like we're constantly reading and and gr- growing our knowledge and our skills and everything like that. And it really got us thinking: what is the difference between a property investor? or a real estate investor and a real estate entrepreneur. Mm. And also, now, and I would say about 90% of the people, probably more that are listening to this podcast are in Australia. And that's not a terminology that we uh, would be familiar with, or maybe you've even heard of, or maybe you've even thought about. So what is a real estate entrepreneur? How does a real estate entrepreneur differ from an investor? What characteristics do they possess? What's this all about? Yeah. All right. So I've got, I've got a piece of an article just here that I'm just going to read through. And it was kind of the catalyst for, for this way of thinking. So a real estate entrepreneur and an investor are essentially one and the same. They use real estate as an investment vehicle to generate income, equity, and tax benefits. However, there are a few noteworthy caveats that must be taken into consideration. A real estate entrepreneur is generally defined as ambitious, risk tolerant, and self-motivated. They possess the ability to create something out of nothing and not only recognize opportunities, but seize them. So Mm. it's a mindset more than anything, really. Yeah. Uh, And it combines, you know, vision with passion and grit. Yeah. I think it's, um, I think it's the key differentiating point between those who want to become a full-time investor or want to be able to use real estate as, um, as a vehicle for freedom and the people who want to use it um, as a supplementary asset class. Yeah. And so what that means, what that means to me is some people are more than happy. And, and again, like this is not, there's no critique in this statement. Some people are more than happy to work their job until they get to retirement age. And really what they're just creating is a, is a nest egg. Mm-hmm. And that's totally cool, right? They're like, okay, I'm going to retire when I'm like 55, 65, something like that. Um, all right, I'm just going to, I've got a little bit of surplus income and I'm just going to keep portioning that away into an asset class. Now, the asset class could be gold. It could be Bitcoin. It could be business. It could be uh, any number of things, but they choose to invest all or a portion of it into real estate. And that's just their, like that's, that's investing, right? Taking, mm-hmm. taking surplus income and just putting it aside and, and allowing it to do its thing. It's fairly passive, right? Yep. It's fairly passive. The difference between uh, a real estate entrepreneur and an investor then is someone who actually wants to use it as a vehicle, right? And also drive that vehicle. Now, Michael E. Gerber, I find it funny that you can never say Michael Gerber. It's always Michael E. Gerber. (laughs) I wonder who decided that he needed to have that E in the middle of his his name. Was he just like, hi, did he stop saying, hi, my name's Michael? Hi, my name's Michael E. Michael E. Gerber. <laughs> Michael is your correct pronunciation. Is your, Gerber. Um, <laughs> so, as Michael Agerba, uh, as Michael E. Gerber says in his book, um, the E Myth mm-hmm. Revisited. The entrepreneur is the visionary in us, the dreamer, the energy behind every human activity, the imagination that sparks the fire of the future and the catalyst for change. Now, that's very interesting. So this idea of being a real estate entrepreneur is, uh, it's, it's also a view of treating real estate like a business. Yes. Okay. And which this we is, talk about a lot. Which we talk about a lot because I think um, not enough people draw the comparisons between property and business. You know, people think of them in complete independent silos. Uh, and I just don't think that that is a, an intelligent, uh, or comprehensive way to consider it. So this, I guess to, to some degree is a bit of a launch pad for a, uh, conversation narrative that we're going to be exploring a lot more over the coming months and years and whatever, because it's something we're really passionate about. And I think that, um, before we get stuck right into it, I just want to get on my soapbox for a little minute. I think that, um, <laughs> I personally get really sick to death of 
real estate pundits just out there regurgitating and spouting the latest core logic data and everything, which is great. Like it's all good. It forms part of a picture. Yes, it forms part of a picture and, that, and that's awesome. But the big thing for me is it's about thinking paradigms, right? And what I would much prefer to be is a voice in the room that is showing people how to think and how to adapt, right? Because if you get stuck down just in the, in the details of like, you know, the amount of times I've had conversations with people, they're like, do you think I should refinance today? Or do you think maybe if I refinance in a month, I'll get one point of zero one percent less of an interest rate? It's like you're thinking, you're thinking the wrong way. Your thinking is not correct. And I'm, I'm sorry. But now, so f- for us, and this is something that we're both really passionate about. We're as passionate about business as we are about property. And those two things are intrinsically entwined. And I think this is really the really something that we want to expand on. Now, for those who are listening, you're going to, you will have noticed that we've um, expanded our offering to two podcasts a week. Uh, I hope you're enjoying that. Now, the, the, the basis of that decision was so that we could have more of these conversations, so that we would have an opportunity to have more time each week to dig into like, real estate mechanics, whether that be through interviews with other real estate uh, professionals and stuff like that, but really allow Gabby and I to focus on um, thinking paradigms and helping to grow your uh, capacity as an investor. Sorry. Sorry to soapbox, hide it. Off the soapbox. All right. Get up, <laughs> I'll, get up, I'll get up my soapbox. No, but I, just wanna, I just wanted to chime in. Just, I really see that that's... Almost your, your and my role in this is to help people gain a better perspective of this, of just the bigger picture of what is happening and mm. what you as an individual listening want from your life and how to see it in a different way. And I always like we're, we're known as being very optimistic people, but I always see when, when I come up against a challenge, I always see it as... I see it optimistically because of the ability to give me a better perspective. I can see that on the other side of that challenge, I'm going to have such a more robust and varied and mature perspective that I don't have right now. And that's generally, that's how I see perspective is so key. And any challenge you can kind of go through is going to give you a better perspective. So yeah, I think I think perspective is really the main thing because you know when you look at um, the changes that have happened in in real estate over even in Australia over the past 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years, um, the makeup of the demographics, economic uh, levers, the you know like it wasn't. Mm. I remember when I was growing up, my parents had seventeen percent interest rates. Yeah, right. Right. Yep. And, you know, even talking to other, you know, successful investors that really cracked their, their journey, they had seven, eight, nine percent interest rates, but they could get 100, uh, 100 plus percent LVRs and all of this kind of stuff. And I think back in the day, back in, back in, the, back in the good old days. <laughs> um, but I think, so I think that really, really, as you said, like our, our role here is to uh, encourage better thinking. Uh, thinking that's going to allow you to adapt and overcome because no one knows what the future holds. And I want to touch on this in a moment, but no one knows what the future holds. And it's very interesting to draw parallels with the US market, I think, because um, we know quite a lot of US entrepreneurs Hmm. and they often say, oh, let's go and invest in Australia. But then they get very confused. (laughs) They get very confused (laughs) <laughs> when we don't just have the same lending and the same um, cash flow. But, but where is the cash flow? Yeah, because it's just such a cash flow centric market over there. Now, in Australia, ostensibly, we have a growth oriented market. We have a growth oriented market. That doesn't mean you can't get cash flow, but it's growth oriented. That's what people care about. It's just a different, it's a different environment. But I think, I believe, and we don't know what the future holds. You know, let's, let's be realistic here. There's no guarantees. Like we could get 12 months down, down the line and, and for a variety of different reasons, the whole real estate market could have flipped upside down, which don't get me wrong, would not be very good. But if you have the capacity to understand where you are, where you want to go, all of this kind of stuff, 
then you are going to be able to adapt and overcome and you're really going to be able to capitalize um, no matter what happens and keep moving towards your goal. So to that degree, and before we continue rambling any longer, we've kind of mapped out, and this is not an exhaustive list, but we just sort of mapped out 10 key elements of your entrepreneurial journey. And I don't want to go too deep into these. I'm going to use this as a framework from where we're going to be doing a lot more um, explorative uh, topics, um, interviews, uh, more podcasts. And also, this is the kind of stuff that we're going to be digging into or that we are digging into and we're going to be helping people with inside our premium online community. And if you're interested in being a part of that, just head to theinvestorlab.com.au forward slash join the community. Um, check it out because there's heaps of cool stuff in there. So let's get ready <laughs> to fumble. <laughs> to fumble. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the 10 key elements of your entrepreneurial journey that you need to think about now in order to move you to where you want to be. Do you want to start, Gabby? Do you want me to? You can start. Okay, cool. So the first is a mission statement. Now, I don't know many uh, property investors who have a mission statement. No. No, and it might... It's not, it's not something they're taught, are you? Yeah, no. Most people don't have a mission statement. Now, we all hear about businesses, oh, yeah, mission, vision, values, business plans, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Fitness. Yeah, and we don't necessarily correlate the same thinking to real estate. And I'd like mm-hmm. to break that down. Hmm. Because a mission statement is imperative to anyone who wants to get anywhere, particularly going back to the point of this, real estate entrepreneur, anyone who wants to become a full-time investor. Now, a mission statement is essentially who you are and why, why you're here. Who are we and why are we here? Now, Walmart, just an example, their, um, their mission statement is save people money so they can live better. Simple, right? Nice. Amazon's uh, mission statement is, our mission is to be Earth's most customer-centric company. This is what unites Amazonians across teams and geographies as we are all striving to delight our customers and make their lives easier, one innovative product, service, and idea at a time. So the difference between those two, one's really long and one's really short. The similarities between those two is that it creates a guiding precip on where people are, where, where they're going, right? Why are they here? Like, what is your purpose? So now there is no right or wrong answer to this. So this is something to think about, but it's very important to have. And you need to get crystal clear clarity on all of these components. So your mission statement might be something like to build a family-centered real estate business, build a legacy for future generations and make a positive contribution to society. Okay. Awesome. Now, I just made that up, right? But (laughs) um, this gives you an idea that you could frame and put on your wall and anytime you're thinking, what the is going on? You could be like, what am I doing this for? Mm. Who, why, why am I here? Where, what is my mission and where am I going? The mission is to build a family-centered real estate business. Again, using the framework of business, real estate business, and build a legacy for future generations and make a positive contribution to society. Now, that will form a framework for how you think about things. Anything to add to that, Gabby? Um, I'm not sure if we're going to talk about it later, but it's kind of the concept of the North Star, if anyone's familiar with that, where it's basically why are you doing any of it? And it's kind of that glowing, that glowing light, that glowing idea that'll keep you, you know, keep you on track, even when things are tough. Cause that's the, that's the piece that I always come back to. It's like, have a, have a mission so strong that even on the worst days, you can still remember why you're doing it. Yeah. Um, and it's get Yeah. Having a mission statement in that sense makes it really, powerful because you can have a piece of paper or something written down that you can just look back and immediately go back to that oh this is why i'm doing it right okay Mm. today might be a bit shit but i remember now it's just it's just one step in the path so yeah 100 percent. and this is that's a really good point there's a couple of things you touched on there that you have written down Mm. you must if you want to give any weight to this you must write it down create a document, right? We're going to talk about business plans and stuff in a minute. Create actually a folder, like treat this as something that's real, not something that you would just like sit and have a little coffee at a cafe and be like, 
I've decided what my mission is and you're just kind of like, yeah, that sounds good. And then you don't do anything with it and then you just move on because you'll forget it. It won't have an impact. Mm. This is something that you need to, it needs to be so powerful, as you said, Gabby, that it pulls you forward, that you almost can't help but continue even when things are bad. Mm. And this kind of leads into the next point. So the North Star is, 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 is a good concept and I think that, I think that that, um, I think that that kind of all everything that we're going to talk about now comes underneath that and will form form that north star. Mm -hmm. So I think if you think about your north star is going to be combined of all of these different elements. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Cool. So I think that covers the mission statement. Who like, and we don't need to. We do. We can do a whole episode just on how to craft a mission statement and what to do about that and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. a mission statement should be a, um, a, a, a well, clearly your mission. Who are you and why are you here? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Next, um, vision, mm. which obviously leads on from the first point on your mission statement, but it's getting really clear on where you are going and having that mental imagery and a very crystal clear picture of the future that you want and the future that is going to benefit your family and your loved ones and everyone around you and getting like so clear on what that looks like because entrepreneurial people they think about the future the future is like the the starting point almost and then they craft the present in a way that is like incremental steps to getting to that future whereas people who aren't as entrepreneurial they're more technicians uh they look forward to like an uncertain future and think of it as a result of present action so it's like today is kind of the 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 starting point and then the future is the result whereas i think entrepreneurial people think about it in reverse and they think about okay today is just a piece of that end goal so i think it's about getting really clear and just like so defined in your mind of what that looks like because then every decision can be formed in line with that 100 percent. i, I Vision is really good, right? Mm -hmm. Because a vision is exactly that. It is, it is what you can see. It's looking into the future. It's fortune telling, right? Essentially, but in a good way. Now, when you look into the future, if you don't clearly know where it is you want to go, you're never going to get there. It's that simple because you don't even know where you're trying to go. Mm -hmm. Now, creating a vision can be altruistic, okay? The vision could be that you, you know, have fed 10,000 people uh, 10,000 homeless people and then you've got a statue made for you or whatever. It could be that you want to own a Porsche, right? Whatever that may be for you, it's about getting crystal clear. What is that vision? What are you striving for? Where are you going? Okay, so firstly, you've got a mission statement, who we are, why are we here? And then the vision is where are we going and what are we striving for? Okay, so that can be future-paced. It's like, we're striving for a, a, a vision of the future that looks like this. For me and my family, uh, for me, my business partners, for me alone, whatever that may be, but you've got to get crystal clear on that. And in fact, um, inside, inside the, the premium membership, I think we're going to have a few uh, frameworks that you can use to download um, that will allow you to start mapping this kind of stuff out because it's critical. Like if you can't put pen to paper about what you want... <laughs> Good luck. Simple, right? So understanding that is 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 critical. And if you don't know, if you don't know why you're here and where you're going, you're gonna have a lot of trouble. Yep. Cool. Then the next the next component with that, that's all well and good. Okay. So we've established why we're here, where are we going? And then you've got principles and values. Most people don't understand what these are. So we've covered mission and vision and then values. But I like principles and values. Mm -hmm. The principles and values that you choose to live your life, operate your business and get to your get to your destination, they are the rules of the game, okay? These are the rules that you're going to create. So you're basically going to be able to say, right, the reason I am here is because I'm going to I want to achieve X. This is my mission. You know, I want to save penguins, whatever, right? And the reason I want to do that is my vision because I'm striving for a future where all, peng all penguins get to wear nice hats, 
That's my vision. And then the principles and values are the rules of the game. And the way that I'm going to get there is I am going to make sure that in all of my actions, activities, outcomes, and effectiveness, I am going to embody, me and my business are going to embody these values and principles. So they could be stuff like um, integrity, innovation, um, uh, charity. It could be service. All, service. It could be any number of things, right? The aim of the game here is uh, probably don't have more than 10, I would say. 10 mm -hmm. to 12 is a good idea. Um, you don't want to, because you could just list, you can just get stuck in listing adjectives and stuff like that, or is adjectives the right word? No, whatever it is. Um, and, and you can kind of be like, oh, I could be like that. I could be like that. Mm -hmm. These are not things that you could be like. These are the core, these are the core values by which you will operate. Family can be a value. So you could prioritize family over money, right? And then that at certain point in your journey will become a, uh, a, a guiding principle that will dictate how you behave in a certain, certain situation. What you say yes to and what you say no to is going to be based on your principles and values, right? Yeah, I think that the exciting way to think about this is basically crafting a rule book for your life. So if you think about, if you, think about you know, the game of life, that game that we're all playing, um, but it's about designing what the rules are for your game of life. Mm. And this is kind of this is kind of what it is. I mean, if you think about like in the biblical sense, there's like what is it, Ten Commandments. That's yeah. basically the rule book for a Christian life. Yeah, is those Ten Commandments. And yeah. this is about what kind of life do I want? Who do I want to be? Aligning that with your mission statement and your vision, and then just going, okay, these are my these are my hard criteria. This is my, you know, my constraints for living life in the way that I want to live to get the result that I want. So I think it's quite liberating to actually do this work because you're right, you can come up with like a list of 10 or 12 max and then you're like, cool, that really defines who I am and where I'm going and yeah. how empowering is that? Yeah, we actually have a list. We and we don't need to go into. It's not all about us, right? So I don't want. To, I don't really want to go into what our mission and vision and stuff is because, like, I want to just encourage people to think independently. But yep. um, we have a list of principles and values that are stuck on our wall, and every day we have a meeting and we talk about what value we are going to embody that day, and and we take it on. Like, it's not just something to gather this dust. You've, it's something you've got to live it and breathe it and smell it. And really, these these values and principles, they're going to be the, um, as you say, the rule book. So when you're like lying on your deathbed, when you're hopefully old and live, lived a very fulfilled life, <laughs> you're going to know that you played the game by the rules that you set, that you lived your vision and your values and your principles and you achieved your missions. Really powerful stuff if you do it like that. Yep. Cool? Yep. All right. Next, business plan. Okay, most people don't have a business plan. Nope. Most business owners don't have a business plan. <laughs> nope. Most people don't do a business plan. Why? Because it seems daunting. And particularly in real estate, people are like, oh, well, I'm not running a business. I don't need a business plan. <laughs> What's this? <laughs> but let me just be um, really, really, really clear with you. Until you can uh, come up with a game plan, you're using, you notice I'm using a lot of game analogies, right? Because this, is, this really is about trying to win the game, right? Whatever that may be. And if you can gamify it, it's really handy. So if you understand the rules and what you're trying to achieve, right? Uh, without having a plan, you're stuffed, right? Can you imagine going onto a battlefield without a plan? So this is what they call the commander's intent as well. So the commander's, in, there's kind of different frameworks. A lot of people get stuck with the business plan because they think it needs to be about 500 pages long and it's going to be full of all this jargon that they don't really understand and SWOT analysis and all of this kind of stuff. And all of that is important, right? But it doesn't have to be that complex. And there are mm -hmm. simplified ways to create a business plan. It really is about giving you the structure that you need to be able to navigate it and, and to give a framework for what you're going to achieve when and why. So this is, this is the game plan. You know, if you were on a uh, soccer field, it wouldn't just be, okay, right? The game plan is kick goals. Right? That just wouldn't be a game plan. The game plan would be like, okay, guys, we're going to have a robust defense here. And then once we're going to, we're going to tactically do this, and then it's going to form part of an overarching strategy. This is, going to be the, this is going to be the state of play. This is going to be the order of things. This is where I'm going to start. 
right? We understand where we want to go. We understand the rules. So then this is where we're going to start. And systematically, this is how we're going to get to where we want to go. This is the game plan. Okay. So that's what it should be. Now, how we relate that to real estate could be things like, okay, with, we, we call it the apex progression, which is basically the three different tiers or three different stages you need to walk through on your um, property investing journey to get to your ultimate destination. So foundation, acceleration, and legacy. Now, I don't want to go into the mechanics of all of that, but it's basically like, okay, so the business plan for, for Stevie might be to get three uh, foundation properties and then lever up to get a couple of acceleration properties. And then once he's done that, and, and then also thinking about that, it's going to be like, well, how's he going to do that? Okay. Does he have the finance? How long is it going to take? What does he need to do to be able to get that? Is he going to do any JVs? Um, does he need to look at vendor finance? Um, like all of this stuff, this is the business plan. How are you going to get there? Like, what are you going to do? Like, like what is the game plan? Mm. Because I can tell you, if you don't have a plan, you're going to drift, right? Has anyone ever seen, I, I refer to soccer because it's a sport that I used to play. Has anyone ever seen like a, like an, and I'm sure it's the same in all sports, but has anyone ever seen like an under eights or like an under, what's it under, whatever the youngest age group is of the sport clubs, under eights or whatever, under, <laughs> yes. under right? And you got about, you got about um, 75% of the sports people on the field Literally just walking around in circles, picking grass, <laughs> like, you know, running up to each other, have a chat. Like, they're just lost. They've got no idea because they don't understand the game plan. Mm. Right? They're, just, they're out there. They're playing soccer. <laughs> they're there. But they don't understand the game plan. So they're not gonna really actually doing anything. They're just like flopping around, rolling about, and getting dirty. <laughs> and that's kind of what happens to you if you don't have a business plan. Great analogy. Look at that. Mm. Mm. I think we. I think just quickly on that, I can't remember who the quote is from, but there's there's a quote about planning is invaluable, but plans ultimately end up relatively useless. There's a quote. There's some kind of quote like that. Mm. But I think as important as it is, like we all know, we all know what happens. You make you make a plan. You might plan out your week, and then things go out the window within the first couple of hours of actually following that plan and then a lot of people i i i get stuck in this all the time as well is you get a little bit in and then you decide well it's all gone out the window now because i'm not sticking to the plan and you know what was the point in doing the plan anyway but i think the point of the plan is is the exercise and the discipline and again the perspective and the the maturity of thinking of how do I build this strategy that is going to suit me? It's not necessarily for the outcome of having, you know, your schedule in place or having your timeline or your budget or exactly how it's going to be because things will change. Totally. Definitely things will change and something will come up, a new door will open and you'll go and walk through that door and you'll try and try something new that wasn't in the plan. But the point of having the plan is that's the starting point and really thinking and committing to what you want to do and where you want to go and how you're going to do that. Mm. It's not to be a rigid, I must do this and nothing can change it. Otherwise, if I step one centimeter out, I'm doomed. Half the exercise is the planning itself. 100%. So that was actually Dwight D, another guy with a, a middle letter, Dwight D Eisenhower. That Eisenhower. That was Eisenhower. So, and the quote is, in preparing for battle, I've always found that plans are use, but useless, but planning is indispensable. Now, think about that for, let's take a military context to that for a moment. Now, this is where it comes down to com uh, commander's intent, okay? Mm. So, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. What he means by that is that plans are always going to break. But the act of planning is the thing that's going to allow you to understand the steps you need to take to get there. So, for example, mm -hmm. if you're on a battlefield and you said, okay, the commander's intent is to go over that, you know, go over that hill. There is a hill in the middle of the city. You can go over it, round it, round it, under it, whatever. Um, but the aim is to get to the other side and capture the flag, right, for example. Now, the plan might be like, all right, guys, we're going to get the troops and we're going to go around the right side of the, we're going to go around the right side of the hill. But I can tell you that, that not, like, and this is where it's all kind of come from, that there's probably going to be unforeseen challenges that you may face. 
and to that degree, you need to be malleable enough to be able to go, okay, well, we didn't realize there was uh, tanks over around that side of the hill. So now we're going to have to go over the top of the hill or whatever that may be. But this is where the commander's intent comes into play and why a business plan is so essential. Because if you understand all of the um, parameters that you're trying to play the game and where you're trying to get to and all of this kind of stuff, this is going to allow you to, to, to move and shift. Well, what are we trying to do here? Uh, what are we trying to do here? and Where are we trying to get to? Now, the business plan should be um, structured enough that you can use it as a game plan. Okay, but don't get so attached to it that you think you can never change it because if, you, if, you, if you're not prepared to change, then it's, not, it's going to be useless. So moving on to the next point, OKRs, objectives and key results. Ooh. So, <laughs> <laughs> so objectives and key results. Now, this is what we call knowing the goal and winning the game. The objectives, like you've got, once you've got your business plan, that's all good. This is really just something to think about, right? Objectives and key results are a great way to form a framework around your activities because if you know what success means, then you can define the activities that you need to do to succeed. So for example, rather than saying, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy houses, right? Rather than saying, I'm going to buy some houses. <laughs> it's good. Good example. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. go, I'm going to go buy some houses. <laughs> it's like, okay, like how many, like, how do you know when you've succeeded in that mm, task? Yep. Right. However, if you said, I'm going to buy two houses in the next 12 months, then you would, it would be um, measurable, manageable, and you would have an objective and a key result. So you would get to the end of that 12 months and you would know, have I bought one or two? Like it's very clearly defined. Mm -hmm. And uh, as creating those kind of definitions with your activities, the objectives and key results, that is going to um, give you the yardstick to keep things on track as you go. Yeah, I think so. OKRs are pretty much an alternative to KPIs. Like I think most people are familiar with KPIs, key performance indicators. OKRs we like because they're more binary. So you can set a time frame and you can kind of look back and be like, did I achieve that or not? Yeah, yes I, or no? I also think it's because it ties the objective in there. Like a KPI, yeah. a KPI might be like, I don't know, did the rent increase by 3%? Hmm. But what is the objective? <laughs> like, what, like yeah. what is the objective? Yep. All right. I think it's a little bit more um, directive in your actions. Yep. Okay. Next. Team building. Team building. See, Team. most people don't think about this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So, so real estate investors don't necessarily think I need to go and build a team. Business owners would be thinking, when am I going to build a team? All right. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs are going to be thinking, how do I, how do I gain the skills to grow a team? Mm hmm. Right? And I think there's a really big difference in that. Now, a lot of people don't, they, they don't think about building a team. They just go, I, I don't know, like I don't just go speak to someone, I guess. I think people think they don't need a team as well, particularly in real estate. I think a lot of people think that they have to do it on their own or that like if there's an expectation that they should learn it all themselves, mm. I think. Yeah. Do you think Elon Musk operated like that? <laughs> No, I don't believe he would. No, have. I don't think so, right? Building a team is critical. It's essential. You don't need to think about Elon Musk. You just think about the local dentist, okay? Mm. Now, if how would you feel if you went to a dentist and they were simultaneously answering the phones, signing people in that came in for an appointment, um, doing the dental work, cleaning up and doing all the stuff, right? How would, you how would you feel? Do you think that would be a good experience? Do you think that would be a successful dentist? I feel like it wouldn't be. No, it would be an absolute schmozzle, right? <laughs> so people don't think about building a team in, in the right way. They think, I'm not a business owner. I don't need to build a team. The team's not for me. I'm not a leader. We'll talk about mm -hmm. leadership in a second, right? But the thing is, you do need to build a team. Now, building a team can be building people above you and below you. Now, depending on your level of commitment to your um, real estate entrepreneurship journey will dictate where and how and why and what you do, right? But it is imperative that you get the right professionals on board to have a reliable team. So a good accountant, um, a good conveyancer, um, potentially a buyer's agent, um, you know, to have good town planner connections, you know, all of these different kind of things. We could talk about um, building your dream team in a, in a different one and we'll go into all of those different roles and why they're good and where. That's probably a good, uh, it's probably a good thing for us to talk about really help people, I think. Yep. But really building a team. Now, you can go a lot further with this as well, by the way. You know, you can 
hire a virtual assistant to help you find properties. Mm. Like there are different ways that you can go about building your team depending on where you're at. Now, you don't necessarily need to bring on people full-time. So you don't need to think, oh, I can't employ all these people. But building a team is about, about creating that framework. Like who is on the bus? It's about getting, people, getting the right people on the bus. Now, if you've established who you are, why you're here, where you're going, what you're striving for, what the rules of the game are, what the game plan is, what the goals are, how are you going to know if you're winning along the way? Now it's about getting the right people on the bus so you can get, to get them to the right destination, right? Yeah. That's actually, it's one of my favorite phrases, <laughs> phrases at the moment. It's getting the right people on the bus. Um, because there's the, there's the concept of it's first, first who, then what. So again, it comes back to perspective. It's like if you get the right people on your team and the right people in your corner, you're adaptable to the what. You're adaptable to a different strategy or different tactics or new opportunities that might come up. If you've got the right team behind you or beside you or in front of you, if you've got the right people there that are going to think about things in the right way, then you can tackle pretty much any challenge that comes up that's going to be like in line with where you're going. I think that's great. No, yeah. I think you're 100% correct. It is, about, it is about getting the right people on the bus, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the idea with that is if you start driving down the road and you need to change course, if you have the right people on the bus, right people on the team, they're going to be, it doesn't really matter. They're going to move with you, mm. right? They're going to move with you. All right, guys, we're turning left. I thought we were going to turn right. All right, cool. Let's turn left. Let's go. <laughs> is it moving us towards our greater yeah. destination, right? Are we still heading in the right direction? Yeah, sure. Let's go left then. Uh, as opposed to, oh, 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 nope. Let me off the bus. You said we were going to go right at this turn and we're not going right. I don't want to part of this anymore. I'm off. Get, let me off the bus. Yeah. I think, I think an example of that in real estate would be like your accountant. Your accountant that you've maybe had all your life, mm. and we see this a lot with particularly new investors. They come in with advice from their accountant, who is like, you know, they've expressed interest that they want to invest, they want to buy an investment property, and they can, and the accountant who they've had to do, you know, their individual tax returns for their, all their life. That accountant is saying, well, oh, I don't know, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think so. And he's like, because they're very tactical, some of them. Mm. And they're just not the right people for that bus moving forward. Did that make sense? Yeah, that's a great analogy. A financial advisor is another one. So, for mm. example, um, an accountant can actually screw you over. This is not to say that all accountants are bad. I love accountants, right? But accountant can screw you over. If, some great accountants. If they're way. not the right person on the bus, mm. because if your accountant's goal, if what if what their vision is and their mission and everything is to um, make you pay the least amount of tax possible you're probably going to stuff up your serviceability at some point. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, but if you have an accountant on board where you're like, this is where I'm going, this is what I'm trying to achieve. And I need you to, to help me with my tax strategy in order to achieve that. That doesn't necessarily mean paying no tax. It might actually mean paying a lot of tax, right? But make sure the tax strategy is correct. Financial planners can also be in a similar boat where someone can go to a financial planner and say, right, I want to, um, I want to start investing. I want to start my investing journey. And they'll go, okay, great. So let's talk about shares. And it's like, well, no, I want to talk about property. No, no, let's talk about shares. And I'll tell you what shares to invest in. Now Mm -hmm. that, whilst it may be very beneficial and I'm not trying to deride any of that advice, I'm not in a position to do that, but they may not be the right people to be on your bus if if property is the way you want to go, as the asset class you want to pursue. Yep. Okay, leadership. Your favorite. Yay. I love leadership. I'm really <laughs> passionate about leadership. And, you know, there's five, there's five levels of leadership on, um, that John Maxwell has defined. I'm, I'm going to do a separate whole podcast on that. As we look, this episode really is about creating the frameworks for you to think about. I really want to take the time and probably do an episode on each one of these mm-hmm. and how to form, formulate these. But leadership is, um, is super important. Most people think, oh, I don't need to be a leader. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't want to be. But leadership is is critical now leadership is something you can apply in your family i know i know that there was a certain point in my life where i took on a leadership role not necessarily the leadership role but took on a leadership role within my family unit with my parents and my brother and all of that kind of stuff right um there are different ways to apply leadership leadership within your family leadership within your community leadership within your business and it's really about exercising the ability to lead your team to the championship. Now, 
most people think of leaders and think they must be extroverts and then they must be the loudest people in the room. That's not, that's not the case. That's not necessarily the case, right? Some of the best leaders that, that commanded the greatest teams played second fiddle in, some, in the public eye. Mm-hmm. And that's a really important distinction. A great book about, uh, about uh, resilience, which touches on this, is uh, Relentless by Tim S. Grover. And he talks about um, NBA sports teams and how sometimes the greatest leaders were the ones who uh, allowed the louder, more ambitious or boisterous star players to, to run the gauntlet and do the stuff and take the fame, but they controlled where the team was going, right? Mm-hmm. And it was really powerful, really pretty, pretty cool to, to read about. Now, the way that this can apply in your um, journey is exercising the leadership to have control over where you want to go. I think an important piece of leadership is there's, there's courage in there as well and it's about taking responsibility. There's a leadership over yourself and your own journey and it's not relying on someone else or someone else's opinion. Um, yes, listen to other people that you trust and I'm not saying you have all the answers within yourself, but it's really just, it's that responsibility piece. It's, it's going, okay, I am the leader of my ship at the end of the day and really owning that and accepting that whether or not you think of yourself as a leader, you are. hundred percent, hundred percent. I think that um, leadership is one of the most important skills that people can learn. There are five levels of leadership and only, it's only the fifth level that requires um, an innate talent. Mm-hmm. All of the other stages of leadership can be uh, learned. You can grow into them, right? And I think that's really important to understand. You know, the fifth level of leadership, we're talking about people like Nelson Mandela, right? That's, the, that's level five leadership, Yeah. right? Level, levels one to four are stuff that you can learn. And I think leadership... Leadership and communication. I would, I would say leadership and sales. Sales is a dirty word. But leadership and communication are the two most important skills you can learn. And in fact, you know what? I'm going to do a whole episode on, just on sales, uh, sales and negotiation because I think people will need nice. to understand how to use that yeah, in their cool. entrepreneur. Because people think about sales and they think about uh, getting called up by a telemarketer saying, do you want to buy something? Um, sales is just communication. And if you can understand sales, you can negotiate better and get better deals. So I think that would be a... Definitely. Yeah, let's yep. do that. All right. Now, marketing is not something that uh, real estate investors think about. Marketing? What do you mean? <laughs> like social media? Mm-hmm. Like what? Ads? But what is marketing, Gabby? What is marketing to you? It is about communicating your expertise and the way that you can serve whoever it is that you're trying to serve it's it's the act of that external communication it's communicating from one to many and trying to bring them closer to you so you can have a more connected conversation mm. Mm. so marketing is one to many and sales is one to one is yes. that what you're saying yeah mm. but they're essentially the same thing it's all communication right yep so and a lot of people get confused they're like what the hell does marketing have to do with me buying properties mm-hmm. now to that, I would ask a, a question. Do you think that I get more opportunities presented to me than the average investor? Yes. Yeah. And I can tell you why. It's not just because, um, it's, not just, well, it's not just because. It's because we've made a point of marketing ourselves as buyer's agents, as all of this kind of stuff. And guess what? Real estate agents come to me and they're like, Goose, can, can I show you this deal? Do you think this might work for one of your people? So we get first, uh, we get, we get uh, what do they call it? The first mover advantage, right? In a lot of marketplaces, which is great. So communication is really about um, building up your networks, communicating your message, what you're looking for, why you're looking for it, what you're prepared to do, all of that stuff. It's how you present yourself to the world. Now, there are many ways that you can do that, right? You can, you can, um, you know, you can share your investor story on podcasts, for example. Mm-hmm. You can write blogs. You can participate in communities and groups. And guess what opportunities will find you? If you have aspirations to really become a real estate entrepreneur, it's really important that you put yourself out there, 
right? And putting yourself out there doesn't mean you might think, oh, I'm a bit of a wallflower. That's not for me. But you just need to think about how you want to show up in the world and how you want people to find you. Because mm-hmm. rather than going out and trying to bludgeon your way to success, you can create an environment where opportunities will come to you. And that is effective marketing, right? Yeah. yeah. I think it's about, it's about sharing, just sharing with as many people, as many relevant people as you can. And it's part of that is, you know, owning your vision and owning where you're going and what you're trying to achieve and communicating that publicly with whoever is relevant with the view that you become the person that they think of when an opportunity comes up that might be relevant for you. So you become that person in the back of their mind. So say you're, say you're looking in a particular area and you get in touch with local sales agents saying, look, this is a, this is the kind of property I'm looking for. I'm looking for a flip. This needs X, Y, Z. Then that sales agent, they might not think about it all the time, but there might be an opportunity that comes up in one month, three months, six months. That's perfect to that conversation that you had and they'll reach out to you. Mm. And that's all come just from maybe one conversation you had. And one, you know, one social media post you may have made saying, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Yep. So I think that's about, it's opening, opening your goals up and sharing that with the world so that they can align, so they can go and look for opportunities for you and, and, and bring, bring them to you that you might not have been able to see yourself. So. 100%. Look, marketing, marketing is really cool because it's so non-linear. Mm. marketing could be like if you have a very specific area that you want to buy in, right? Let's just say it's um, want to buy in the suburb of Elwood in Victoria, right? Mm. Then there's different ways you could go about marketing yourself in that area as a potential buyer, Mm. right? You could contact real estate agents. You could go into real estate agents, offer them a copy. These are all buyer's agent tricks, by the way. I'm not going to let you answer some secrets here, right? You can build relationships. You can send them little gifts. You can post on social media. You can join communities of like-minded people in that area. You might and and communicate with people like, oh, oh, yeah. Look, I'm thinking about moving to Elwood. Um, I'm looking for a place, but I'm looking for a very specific type of place, you know. And then talk to people about what they want. And then when something comes up, they're going to be like, oh, I remember that person. They said that they were looking for something on that street that had a pool and did this thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know the perfect person is going to fit. This is marketing. It's all about communication. It's about putting your intention out to the world and allowing the opportunities to come to you. Yeah. Now, uh, a great place to do that is obviously inside our, our premium community at theinvestorlab.com.au because inside there, you can share what you're trying to do, how you're trying to do it and why and yeah. share that with other people who might find opportunity. I find opportunities all the time that aren't good for me and Gabby or even our clients. And mm-hmm. I'm like... I don't even know what to do with all of these, right? And it's hard for me to necessarily want to go, well, I'll just go find people for these opportunities because we're running business, doing our own stuff. However, I can tell you that if I was in a community of people who said, what I'm really looking for is a subdivision project in Majigonga West and I happen to come across one, I'd be like, yo, I just got to, I've just found this opportunity. You want it? And you work that out. And that's all about marketing and communication. Yeah, that's actually a really good point because there are a handful of people that we know, we're, not our clients, but have been in our community for a while, that we know their briefs. Like there, there's yeah. some that, you know, just are just looking for subdivision projects. They just want, you know, splitters or anything subdividable. So occasionally an a, a, a opportunity will come up for us where it's like, might not suit one of our clients, but you do think of that person mm. purely because they've been marketing themselves deliberately or not deliberately, but they've said, look, this is what I'm trying to achieve just so it's in the back of everyone's heads. 100%. It's awesome. 100%. Yep. Now, look, I'm mindful of time. So let's keep, we always tend to do this. We, give, we go long in the start and short in the end. So um, the next kind of key point is about innovation. Now, a lot of people think about innovation. They think it's like, what does that mean? Inventing new things, designing a new bowl? Like, no. <laughs> uh, innovation, innovation is adaptability. Uh, it's adaptability, right? It's the ability to pivot. And innovation mm-hmm. is really the cornerstone of any success. Now, I want to touch on this, right? Because uh, I don't want to hang on this to too long, right? Yep. But the ability to pivot and change doesn't mean that you just ad hoc do whatever. We don't, like, we don't, 
we don't buy off the plan properties for our clients. Nope. So that's like, that's not in our mission, vision or values. Does that mean the good opportunities come up in that space? Yep. The opportunities for us to make lots of money. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that we just pivot and change and willy nilly ad hoc shift things around. Innovation is not a uh, change for change's sake. It is the improvement of whatever you need to do to get to where you want to go. Mm-hmm. Now, for example, let's just say we, we transmuted time and space and um, the, the, US, the US market conditions became the Australian market conditions and we had very low growth, um, high yields and different lending policies, for example. And if we had that kind of environment, how would that change your journey? Like if that happened overnight, like would you be able to adapt and overcome or would you be able to pivot? Like what would change? Like all mm-hmm. of this kind of stuff. This is innovation. It's the ability to adapt to changing conditions because if you're too rigid in your thinking, things that are rigid break. Yeah. That's interesting actually because um, everyone's familiar with the the survival of the fittest concept. Um, but Darwin's definition of fittest is not actually the strongest or the biggest or the most powerful. It's actually the most adaptable. Mm. That's the definition. So that's exactly what we're talking about. It's the ones that can adapt and be flexible, understanding their rule book, their values, their mission, but being able to adapt and be flexible to the current situation to survive. Mm. I've, I just found that a really interesting That's awesome. Thing That's to awesome. Learn. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So it's adaptability and innovation, um, but also sticking to your mission, vision, and values, yep. right? Playing by the rules of your own game. Yep. Lastly, it's uh, finance and money management. Yep. A lot of people hate spreadsheets. They hate numbers. It's just crazy like, people. Yeah, we love them. <laughs> we love them. Um, it is imperative to understand your financial position and to be in control of your finances. If you're not then you're going to have a very hard time trying to get ahead, right? Because mm-hmm. you won't understand where your money's going. And look, I'll be the first to admit, it's not, it's not a straight line situation. You know, we, we, got, we critically analyzed what we were spending all of our money on and everything like that. And then, and then we started drifting. We, got, we had income creep right? and our cost of living went up and all that. Ah, well, ah, we just, ah, that's all right. We'll just get this. We'll just get that. We'll just do this. We'll just do that. And our cost of living started going up. And then we went back and reviewed our numbers and we're like, whoa, hang on. This is not moving us to where, to where we want to go. This is not in line with our vision, values, mission statement, and all of that kind of stuff. And so we just took a whole bunch of stuff to the chopping block recently. Mm-hmm. We just went, nope, chop it off. No more. Invigorating. Oh, it was great, right? So knowing your numbers and making them work for you is essential. And this is one of the key pillars of any good business owner, right? You, you, you can show me a business owner who doesn't know the numbers. And I'll show you a business owner that's struggling. Boom. <laughs> so <laughs> my boom was better. <laughs> boom. <laughs> boom. So, and that's critical. Like if you don't understand the numbers, right? And that means the numbers now and the numbers you're forecasting. Mm-hmm. You, I, I can't put enough emphasis on this. Yeah. I will literally spend sometimes, if I, if I need to really get to the bottom of something, I'll spend 14 hours at a stretch staring at a spreadsheet till my eyes bleed. Making, yeah, and I'll do that for days in a row. I'll just Sunday t- morning. Oh, literally, yeah. It could be 5 a.m. on a Sunday morning and I will be like two hours deep into a, into a nine-hour spreadsheet session where I'm just trying to understand what's happening, what, how, how everything's interconnected and what, what levers I can pull when. Understanding, understanding the numbers is critical to understanding um, the metrics that you can operate your business. Um, mm-hmm. So I hope that people can see how all of this stuff relates to their real estate journey. Do you think so? I think so. I think each of the points are pretty pretty relevant. And I, I I like the way that we've done this and we've like it's trying to make it really obvious that they are they can be followed in the same way. Mm-hmm. They're all relevant and they're all just different ways that you can think about being a professional real estate entrepreneur. Yep. Like making that committing to that as a thing in your life. And there's a framework for it. Totally. And I think the important thing is that you don't need to be like, oh, well, this is only for me if I want to quit my job right now and go and start doing this full time. Mm. You could be a business owner already and you, your, your business plan with real estate 
is that in the next five years, in the next 15 years, I want to achieve this goal. You may be working full time and, and go, okay, so my business plan with real estate is I'm going to do two deals a year for the next six years. These are the, um, these are the outcomes I want to achieve. This is why, this is where I'm going. And therefore, if I do all of that, I should be able to quit my job in like six years. All right. So building all of this stuff out doesn't mean just go and, you know, close your business or quit your job or whatever, but it's about creating that framework to allow you to understand how to, how to map out your own journey and how to get to where you want to go. And this is critical, I think, for, for everyone. So, because without knowing who you are, why you're here, where you're going, the rules of the game, the game plan, the goals, the team, or yeah, without exercising leadership, without knowing how to market, without, without understanding innovation, knowing your numbers, you're going to struggle to make the deep and impactful change that, that I know that you want. So, okay. I think I'm, we- I'm excited for people to, to actually think about how this applies to them. And if, they're, if you're at that stage where you're thinking about like, this is something that I really want to do. This isn't like a side hobby for me anymore. This is like, I need to put some effort in. This is a really good place to start. Yeah. If you, if you, if you identify as a real estate entrepreneur, right. And just to go back to that, that's anyone who wants to become a full-time investor. Mm -hmm. If you want to make this your full-time gig, if you want to become a, if you want to be able to gain more freedom in your life, um, or if you're a business owner and you're thinking about really real estate investing and you want a bit of a framework, this is really beneficial, right? And I would love to get feedback. If you are listening to this episode and you've found this, you've resonated with this and you like the idea of being a real estate entrepreneur, then I'd love feedback. I'm sure Gabby would as well. So, you know, if this, if this has resonated with you, if you've liked the content, let us know. Um, leave us a comment. If you're watching this on YouTube, leave us a comment or send us an email. Hello at dash dot.com.au. Whatever. Get in touch. You can find <laughs> us. You know where we are. We've got you all, com- we're all over the place. If you can't find out how to get in touch with us, um, I would say you're not being innovative enough or something. Um, okay, so I, I really hope this has helped give people a thinking paradigm and a framework uh, for the property journey to achieve better results. And of course, if you want to join a, um, a community of like-minded entrepreneurs, investors, and people just like you and I, yay, yay! head to theinvestorlab.com.au, check it out, join the community, and we'll see you on the inside. Bye.